Thanks so much, everybody. We are so glad that you're here today. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Stefan Niccolo. Stefan is an investor, advisor, and founder with more than 15 years of experience investing and operating in social and environmental impact. He is a partner at Full Cycle, which is a private equity firm that's focused on accelerating climate critical infrastructure solutions. He heads capital solutions for the firm, uh, managing institutional relationships and the firm's capital formation for its fund vehicles. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing uh, Stefan last week in New York City for Climate Week, and I learned that he is lovingly known as the methane guy for all the right reasons. And Stefan will be in conversation with Project Drawdown's uh, executive director, Dr. Jonathan Foley. John is a world-renowned environmental scientist, sustainability expert, author, and public speaker. Uh, his work focuses on understanding our changing planet and finding new solutions to sustain the climate, ecosystems, and the natural resources that we all depend on. Y'all, we are so grateful that we have Stefan and John joining us today. Welcome, Stefan. Welcome, John. Good afternoon. Thanks, Elizabeth. And um, yeah, thanks everybody too for uh, everyone who's attending our um, Drawdown Ignite uh, seminar series from all around the world. It's fantastic um, to have you all here today. Um, and one thing too, just to, uh, to say is we are we're going to be recording this um, conversation and uh, releasing the video for that in the coming days as well. So uh, you'll be able to share that with other folks who might not be able to be here today. But uh, Stefan, welcome. Uh, so good to see you again, uh, virtually. You so and, yeah. Um, so we're just going to have kind of a conversation today and pick your brain about a really important topic, uh, or a whole range of topics, but really starting off in the realm of kind of climate and investing. Um, but first, before we even get into all that, um, maybe I, I just think folks ought to hear your story of how you got into all of this. You have a really interesting kind of backstory, uh, origin story as a superhero methane guy, I'd say. Um, and it would be really fun to kind of share that because I think we all come to this work from lots of different trajectories. And it's fun to hear about, um, love to hear about yours. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to embrace the moniker of being the methane guy. And as Elizabeth, Elizabeth said, I, I hope it's for all the right reasons. So I'm grateful for that. So um, yeah, I appreciate the question, right? I think uh, in climate, sometimes people make the assumption that you've been doing this forever, or that you were born with the skill set. Um, this is all new. And so my advice to folks is always to, to jump in. Um, your lived and professional experience matters. For me, um, you know, I started my career uh, studying politics, uh, philosophy and economics at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, I've had some full circle moments since then. As an intern, when I was 19, I was working for then presidential candidate John Kerry. And so it's really awesome these days to be in the room in a very different context with uh, Secretary Kerry and his team focused on climate. Um, but I wasn't always focused on, on climate nor impact. I uh, started my career in the capital markets and, um, you know, saw very early that uh, capital is just a resource. It has no moral value. Um, it does what we tell it to do in the market. And so, you know, coming up, uh, working inside of some of the larger financial institutions as a consultant, um, I really kind of was firsthand to watching incredible growth and watching capital really move to scale technology and venture, um, real estate during the boom years, um, and also during the financial crisis saw capital moves uh, in a way that harmed communities and people. And I realized that I wanted to point my career towards doing good work that's in support of people and communities and used capital and the many ways we can deploy it as a resource um, to, to, to do just that, to lift people up. Uh, so I started kind of on Wall Street, made that pivot, um, founded my own firm that kind of worked with investors and became very curious around the role that institutional and family office investors could play in building a world that just works better for people, that is more equitable, that was more sustainable. And those principles kind of took me through um, a lot of investing work that we did across many, many different asset classes. Uh, one thing I'll highlight is we, we spent some time uh, playing a role in the redevelopment effort of LaGuardia Airport. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure many people here, there's so many people signed in from all over the world, but I'm sure a few 
have had uh, the the experience of flying into New York via LaGuardia, and um, <laughs> you know it became very clear in the in the teens, uh, uh, 2015, 2016, around that that around that time, um, that we needed better infrastructure in New York, um, that there was a better way to design that big asset to deliver more value to more people and to keep in mind the community in which we build these assets. And I think the piece that really turned my attention towards climate was that LaGuardia is an airport at sea level, yet we weren't really taking into consideration what needed to be done to make it a more resilient asset uh, to rising sea levels and to storm surges um, and all the complexities that those climate events bring. And so that was really kind of the aha moment for me of, well, there's something here um, in how we deploy this resource of capital that should have uh, in its consideration in the equation that we put together when we make investments center to that central to that should be climate considerations. Um, shortly after working on that project, uh, my business partner, Brahim Al Husseini and I got together um, and started really ideating around what the model would look like to accelerate climate solutions um, and to think about resiliency as the center of, of some of the decision-making mitigation as a theme um, that would help us drive investment into companies and into technologies and into infrastructure. And so that was kind of the, the genesis story, as it were, of the thinking around Full Cycle, which is the fund we operate now to invest in climate critical companies and their infrastructure projects. You know, part of our theory of change is that everything uh, in our in our communities, in our infrastructure, needs to be overhauled. Um, and so that's a huge opportunity to deploy capital and to build better power, waste, water, infrastructure um, in a way that's climate forward, that is carb low carbon, um, and that delivers more value to more people at lower cost. And so um, I'm so grateful that, you know, I get to work on something that is just this important and that so much of my experience, my lived experience summates to the work that I do every day. Um, but if there's one thing I would hope people take away is that your experience summates to impact in climate as well. It just may come to this, this realm of climate uh, a bit differently, but it matters very greatly. And we need everyone in the fight to, to make a meaningful response to climate, climate change. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, that resonates with uh, me and I'm sure a lot of folks on this call. Uh, and in, in one of our colleagues, of course, uh, Jamie Alexander is famous for coining a phrase that, you know, every job's a climate job. Right. And maybe <clears throat> in parallel to that would be like, in, in every training you get in life, it's some kind of climate training, probably, because we need everybody everywhere doing everything uh, to make this kind of great transformation. And so, um, yeah, it's 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 all hands on deck, I guess, is the way to look at it, perhaps. Um, but I, I'd really love to kind of pick your brain on this this huge topic. Um, it's something that I'm struggling to learn more about uh, with not a background in finance or business or investing at all. But it, it is becoming more and more clear that um to, to a lot of folks that we, you know, one of the prerequisites of addressing climate change is moving a lot of money, a lot of capital, a lot of resources that go with that out of things that are harming the planet, of course, things like fossil fuels and destructive industry and unsustainable forms of agriculture. You got to pull money out of that stuff, but better yet, put money into good stuff, things that are the 21st century ways we're going to move forward uh, in renewable energy, sustainable ag, new industries, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is a staggering amount of money, um, you know, in the trillions per year is what basically all the estimates say we need to do. That's a lot of money. And that's going to involve a huge um, movement of capital. Um, first is kind of how are we doing in terms of the magnitude of that? You know, are we even getting close to the right number of zeros? Um, for a long time, we weren't. But um, then not just the quantity of that movement of capital, but are we moving it in the right places? Where would you say we are to kind of start off the conversation there? How, how do you think we're doing? Yeah, so, um, I mean, the answer is we've seen an incredible uh, increase in the quantum of capital, the amount of capital pointed at climate, um, climate infrastructure, climate technologies, the whole realm uh, has really been the beneficiary of dramatic capital inflows, um, both from the private sector, private side, and then from institutions as well. That's heartening and that's encouraging. We need all the capital that we can get. Um, but the reality is we're still way short, right? <laughs> and this is, as you said, this is a, a problem of trillions. Um, and so we're talking about 
the mobilization of a tremendous amount of capital that has to come from everywhere, you know, how do you aggregate trillions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. It's never going to come from one institution or even one sector. It means that every institutional investor, every endowment, every pension, every sovereign has to have a comprehensive approach towards deploying capital into climate. That means putting capital directly into assets. That means investing in companies. But that takes a lot of infrastructure build out to know which companies to invest in. And so really what it means is deploying capital into fund managers whose professional job it is to select the assets that will do the work most effectively. Um, you know, so that's the, the, the news that maybe isn't so hopeful is that we still have a long way to go to get the amount of capital necessary. I mean, just in energy alone, we're looking at a three to five trillion dollar, uh, you know, per annum investment need in order to turn over uh, that sector into low carbon options. So it's got a long way to go. But the hopefulness that comes from this is that uh, we have the capital, right? Every year globally, we invest about $200 trillion into stuff, into stocks, into bonds, into real estate, into all sorts of other investments. So suddenly three to five trillion doesn't seem that insurmountable, right? This is single yeah, basis, two single percent. percentage points, right? Two For percent that, to save the world, who cares? <laughs> right? You know? I mean, yeah. think think about the amount of money in the last couple of years that has gone into NFTs for art, that has gone into <laughs> um, all, all sorts of things that I'm sure have plenty of intrinsic value, um, but maybe won't do the work necessary. <laughs> yeah, or not, right? But maybe but maybe won't do the work necessary to, to create the conditions for stability on our planet. So ultimately, this comes down to choices, right? It comes down to where we choose to deploy capital. And I think... You know, again, everyone plays a role here. You don't have to be a CIO of a pension fund in order to move capital where we individuals and consumers bank, um, the types of financing decisions we make, the institutions that we put our capital uh, into really matter. And, and folks, you know, at that level, at the institutional level, should be hearing the message that we're no longer just idly sitting by not knowing what to do with our resources if the large financial institutions at, at which you uh, bank or do business aren't doing the work for climate, you should move your assets and they'll hear that message. Yeah, um, I'm glad you said that. Actually, a little plug for uh, Project Drawdown. Um, in the coming months, uh, a little little foreshadowing here, we'll be having a report that's going to kind of go deeper into the question of our own personal banking of, you know, where we put our money, where's the savings and checking accounts and where we save even our own little personal funds can have a pretty big uh, kind of indirect kind of handprint of money in addition to our own footprint of carbon. And so when people ask you know, a lot of, you know, hey, what can I do to address climate change? You said it, you know, one of the things is where we save, uh, where our money is sitting and whether that money is, you know, being used to enable expansion of fossil fuels, which isn't maybe something we all want, uh, but maybe instead is in the hands of people who loan it to people who are investing in a better future. And those choices are still up to us. Um, we just need to have more clarity and maybe more choice in our things like 401k plans and savings and all. But that's at the kind of commercial um, banking level. But in the world of investing where you are, um, uh, you and I talked a lot about this. And this is something that's really fascinating. Uh, problem is we have suddenly this, you know, um, very large movement of money from like philanthropy from foundations and donors and stuff who want to do good things uh, and impact investors, people who kind of lead with the mission before with financial returns. Yeah. Then you got more traditional investors who want to invest money for financial returns, but hopefully do some good along the way too. I think most people want to do that. And then of course we have huge governments and pension funds and big you know, institutional investors as well. Um, that whole kind of capital stack, um, uh, which I didn't know that term until a year or two ago, um, all the different kind of flavors of money out there that are doing different kinds of things. Um, as we begin to deploy that to address climate change, one of the disconnects that you and I've talked about a lot over the last year or so is the disconnect between where the money flows and where maybe the best kind of physics solutions, the best carbon solutions from a science point of view might be. How the scientists view the world as like, here's where you should put your bets. And where the money people kind of are looking to say, here's where I'm placing my bets for other reasons. Sometimes they line up and sometimes they're a little bit off. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, where do you think that kind of conversation needs to go to kind of get a better alignment of the resources we need 
and the experience and the know-how of getting things done by moving capital. But how do we reconcile that with the kind of scientific necessity of putting work in different parts of the economy, like in electricity and industry and so on? How do we line up the money and the science, do you think? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's a brilliant question, right? And I think, you know, we have seen, and I think Drawdown and, and some other resources have shared kind of the understanding of where the emissions are coming from relative to where we are deploying capital. And your first point is a brilliant one, which is not all capital is the same, right? And so different buckets of capital serve a different function when we're trying to build out new infrastructure, when we're trying to build out first of a kind projects, when we're scaling technology, uh, when we're retrofitting existing buildings and assets. And so understanding the role that each kind of capital from philanthropy to venture capital to kind of more down downstream infrastructure mm -hmm. capital, the role that these pools of capital can play is different as we go through this kind of story arc of ordering our, our way of building out a low carbon economy. And so I think part of it is first understanding where the emissions are coming from, right? Um, if you look at venture capital, for example, you know, we started this off by saying there's so, such an increase of inflow of capital, specifically around venture capital um, coming into early stage technologies and companies that are innovating mm -hmm. in a really meaningful way. That's exciting, except we are maybe perhaps over indexing that capital in things like electrification, uh, uh, transport, um, you know, electric vehicles, charging infrastructure, all these yeah. things are critically important for the decarbonization of our sector, but we don't have infinite capital. Although we know where the capital is, we don't have infinite capital pointed at the issue. So there is um, a trade-off in putting capital into one area versus another more emissions intensive area like agriculture or building efficiency, where we could have a tremendous impact at lower cost. The solutions in these sectors oftentimes are low tech. Sometimes they are negative cost, meaning they save something of value if you implement them. And so um, right-sizing the capital to the sources of emissions is gonna be the name of this game over the next decade. And you know what we hope to demonstrate in the ways we've deployed capital um, at a full cycle is kind of thinking about the infrastructure piece of the equation and say, well, wait a minute, we're gonna need quite a large amount of capital to build out new power plants that are carbon free, to build out new uh, circularity solutions and recycling solutions that make value out of waste. Um, and so understanding that helps us to approach institutional investors to say, okay, this is the role that you can play as a large pension deploying, say, 150 million a year every year for the next 10 years in a climate program uh, way of investing, as opposed to kind of one-off ways of funding things that don't really compound to efforts that we can see or to, to impacts that we can see. So right-sizing the capital is an important piece, augmenting the pie, the amount of capital we deploy into the sector uh, is an important piece. But I think it's central to that is knowing where the emissions are coming from, trusting the science and the data to help guide our decision-making as principles in this space, to be able to say, well, actually, as investors, we don't really wanna be in a crowded field of everyone building the same thing anyway, right? We wanna diversify our exposure and maybe go into an area where there's less attention, but maybe more opportunity to generate returns, both climate and financial. That's the task at hand. I love that. I love that. Um, a shorthand in my head always is kind of like, we need to align the capital with the carbon. Uh, that there ought to be a rough one-to-one -one correspondence for like, hey, the amount of money we put into a solution area ought to be kind of roughly proportional to the size of the solutions needed. So um, when venture capital puts, well, the last couple of years, about half to two thirds of all venture capital was in one category, electric vehicles. That's more like 5% of the total emissions abatement possibility. So two thirds of the money went into 5% of the carbon play. That's a, that's a disconnect. Um, for any given year or two, it might make sense, but long-term, we need to have a better alignment. And like you said, there might be some low-hanging, cheaper fruits that other forms of capital could go seek if it's not venture, maybe some other money, uh, like in agriculture, land use, and other things. So that's um, some really good, really good ideas there. But the other thing I was going to ask you about, because this is a kind of a signature of your thinking, I think, and of your fund, 
is we need to align capital with carbon, kind of the overall portfolio of the atmosphere should align to our portfolio of money, more or less, towards the end of the day, and different flavors of money doing different things. But we also need to align our resources with time, because um, this is something a lot of folks kind of miss. Uh, climate change is a cumulative problem. It's the area under the curve of emissions that matters the most, not this year's emissions, all the emissions accumulated over time. So, you know, the temperatures we're seeing now are because of 100 years worth of pollution, not this year's pollution. Right. Same thing in the future as we move towards climate solutions. Um, the long, like the earlier we implement a climate solution, the longer it affects the atmosphere. So we deploy a climate solution next year, it can work for about most 30 years till mid-century. And so that's great. Early solutions start working now and accumulate a total large impact. But the longer we wait, the less time those solutions have to work in the atmosphere. So we talk about the time value of carbon, the later solutions, kind of high tech solutions like fusion or carbon capture or other kind of fancy gadget like solutions that sound great. But the longer you wait for them, the less effective they automatically will be in actually addressing climate change. You have to discount them um, about 7% a year, every year that they're not here today. Yeah. So that really should weight portfolios towards solutions that are here now, uh, because they can start accumulating impact, just like if saving money now pays off in the long run. Same thing with saving carbon pays off in the long run. Um, how do you address that in your thinking and portfolio? Because I think you're firm is kind of unique in thinking about, you know, immediate solutions and uh, the importance of time that, you know, high tech, far away solutions sound great, but they aren't going to make as big a difference as near term, possibly low tech and infrastructure investments. And that's where you've been operating more. Uh, can yeah. you tell us more about that? How does that work? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, the function of time is, is one that um, we've really got to get good at understanding and the ways that it informs all the kinds of decision making. So I'll give Kind of two two ways we we think about it that have helped us put our thesis together and actually help some of the work um, that that we're doing around methane in particular. So the first is, um, as you mentioned, we've got to build out the solutions that can apply to the most emissions intensive industries today. Right. If we wait for uh, new technology to be ready for commercialization in five years, we'll lose all of that area under the emissions curve, as as you mentioned. Right. So. Um, you know, the things we can do now are better at at the long equation we've got to put together at helping us solve this immediate term. And so when we invest uh, at full cycle, we think about kind of market ready solutions, things that are at a high technology readiness level that can integrate into the existing value chains of big corporates, of big industry, agriculture, waste, energy. Um, we think about kind of this immediate term as, you know, as Drawdown puts it, the emergency breaks, you know, this is one of our, our actions here that we can deploy capital into technology that's ready today, right? It's um, it's exciting to think about the stuff that's coming out of the labs that we see announcements about, um, but ultimately if it can't apply most places in the world, uh, mm -hmm. then we're just doing small things that don't compound, the efforts don't compound to the material outcomes that we're pushing towards. So that's the first piece is we've got to get to work now and the solutions that are ready today are more than capable of material decarbonization in the sectors that are most um, emissions intensive. But the second piece to that is it helps us, you know, this understanding of time and impact helps to, to order uh, the operations that we will take. So what I mean by mm -hmm. that is it helps us to focus on the most high impact greenhouse gases knowing that in this short period of time, uh, diminishing and reducing our methane emission has a huge impact on the curve that we are arcing towards through 2050 and beyond. And mm -hmm. so that's that's the reason we focus so much on methane as a short-lived time pollutant. It's that um, the work, you know, so let me back up. Mm -hmm. Methane as a molecule, uh, on a 20 year basis is 86 times more heat trapping than CO2. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something you and I talk about a lot that we say a lot when we speak, but five years ago, we weren't having any conversations generally in these spaces around methane. Maybe on the scientific side we were, but as it, it wasn't translating to 
the investments yeah. that folks are making, right? So yeah. we needed to do a little bit of education to get people up the curve to understanding why we should focus on the shorter lived climate pollutants like methane. And in the in the thinking around time, um, you know, even the data that we were consuming back then was based on a hundred year metric for what happens to a molecule of methane in the atmosphere. But that wasn't giving us an accurate snapshot of the problem. And in fact, the, the climate destabilization that we are all experiencing in different parts of the world is a result of the fact that on a shorter time frame, the immediate time frame, uh, methane is doing way more damage than we know. We are underestimating the amount of it that is being emitted into the atmosphere. And so here is this opportunity to focus on this really, uh, you know, methane is less than 1% of the math of our emissions on an annual basis and it's responsible for nearly a third of the warming. So while yeah. scary that may be, it is an opportunity to have a huge lever of impact by focusing on methane emissions and the sources of methane emissions in our global economy, and then thinking about the massive impact that could have by reducing those emissions in the time frame that matters the most. So time has to be at the center of what we focus on and the order in which we focus on those things. Um, we did it in our investment thesis, obviously, um, Drawdown talks about it as one of the key emergency breaks. Um, and I'm, I'm eager to share more about the methane work we got we got done last week as well, because I think that'll help uh, order a lot of folks thinking around the greenhouse gases that matter the most and what we do about them. Yeah, I hope uh, in the audience, uh, if folks remember, you know, <clears throat> um, well, hopefully more than one thing from this webinar, but one thing I really hope sticks with folks is the importance of methane. Um, as, you know, Stefan was just saying, to, uh, as you were just saying, you know, it's 80 to 90 times more powerful than CO2, molecule for molecule, um, in the first 20 years after it's emitted. Uh, in fact, um, it's kind of amazing. This year's emissions of greenhouse gases, some methane, some CO2, and a bunch of other stuff, the methane is going to actually warm the atmosphere for the next 20 years more than the CO2 will for 20 years. And then we're going to emit a bunch more next year and next year and next year. Now, a thousand years from now, it won't matter. It'll just be the CO2 left. But in real time, living through this emissions cycle that we are in right now, in real time, methane's warming the planet more than CO2 as we're speaking, period, from the recent emissions. And a total, as you mentioned, about a third of the total warming cumulatively has been caused by methane. And yet it doesn't get nearly a third of our attention. Uh, in fact, we kind of joke about, oh, yeah, the methane stuff from cows or whatever. It's really, really important. So I hope folks kind of keep that in mind. And also, you know, as you know, too, um, the two big areas for methane are kind of the energy sector, because methane is also called natural gas. And I'll ask you about that some more, but also from the kind of biogenic side, from agriculture, cattle, rice fields, but also landfills and other kind of sources of methane that are more biological in nature that we control. So when you think about that, and I think your firm and you are quite unique in focusing a lens on methane as kind of a key lever um, it's the fastest moving part of the climate system. If we pull on that first, we could slow the rate of warming and maybe even ultimately, you know, give us more time to kind of work on the rest of the gases like CO2 that might be a little harder. That's really smart, I think. And I don't hear a lot of investors talk like that. Um, what, what specifically does that mean? What have you learned and where are the investable opportunities to make a big difference in methane, both in that kind of bio side and energy side, would you say? Yeah, so it's funny. Someone said to me last week, and um, so I, I won't take credit for it, but uh, they said we have to win the methane sprint in order to even run the CO2 marathon. Um, yeah. That, that's Beautiful. the right way of thinking about it, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I wish I'd come up with that. So, <laughs> yeah, so, that's um, good. <laughs> so, I mean, the thing about methane to understand is that, first of all, we all generate it. Um, and, and, you know, part of the understanding that's key is that most of the sources of methane in our global economy um, are addressable. So in ag, for example, um, you know, all of the waste from agricultural production typically uh, rots, gets wet and rots, and so that emits methane into the atmosphere. So better waste and manure management is a really low hanging fruit way to address methane emissions. Mm -hmm. um, we talk a lot about cattle and enteric fermentation. That's what the scientific name is. Um, you know, these are animals that are digesting organic material um, and then burping and, and uh, 
uh, farting methane. And so, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, thinking about what are the interventions there means perhaps feed additives or, you know, better ways of, um, you know, grazing cows in open environments helps us to help manage those cows emissions related to methane. Um, in the energy sector, you know, you're talking about leaks, right? This is about better infrastructure. So mm -hmm. if at every refinery pumping station and along every pipeline in every gas field, um, we plugged the leaks, we uh, managed the fugitive methane coming from those fields, um, we would accomplish the 30% reduction that was set out at COP26 with room to spare, right? So we, in one sector, we can, we can tackle these um, large ambitions to reduce methane. Um, and then again, in waste, you know, thinking about landfills or open pits, you know, dealing with our waste differently is a really smart way, not only to manage methane emissions, but to turn something that is valuable into value in our economy. We just throw our waste away, but there is no way, right? We all live on a, on a closed sphere and a closed planet. And so um, dealing with our waste better, especially our biogenic waste is really important. Um, mm -hmm. And so those, uh, those three understandings helped us to make an investment thesis that would focus on waste, circularity, energy, um, and, and helped us to identify the innovators that are pointing their innovations and their solutions at these industries. Um, and now the question is, how do we make sure the big players in ag, in energy, in waste are not only aware, but are tasked with embracing these technologies and innovating in these sectors that have not really been disrupted or innovated in, in, in centuries, right? When's the last time we heard of kind of waste innovation or ag innovation that reduced <laughs> emissions? Yeah, it's just, you know, we, we, um, I will say we got a little complacent with the systems operating in the background. And now we're kind of caught having to play a little bit of catch up, but all that's doable, right? The solutions are here, the capital's available, um, and the models exist to deploy them. And, and that, that heartens me. That lets me know uh, that even though it's gargantuan challenge, by identifying this lever of action and then identifying the ways in which we can deploy capital into it, I think we have a really a good shot at reducing methane emissions and actually having a conversation around, you know, about planetary cooling and the ways we can go in a different direction than the current trajectory would suggest. Yeah, well, um, I want to ask one more methane question because I, I just know there'll be a lot of audience interest in this too. And then maybe we'll shift to more of the COP and stock take recently and then leave time for Q&A soon. So we'll, we'll wrap up in a few minutes here. Um, but one more methane question because I know everybody, uh, we, we all relate to this part of methane because we all eat. And so when you're talking about methane emissions from the kind of the biological side, the idea of like, hey, uh, what we dump in landfills, that can go anaerobic and turn into methane. Let's go there. Let's go after manure. Let's go, you know, the waste side of it. Uh, and feeding cattle, uh, maybe, you know, feed additives where you can or grazing practices are somewhat different. But, you know, an obvious question, but maybe it's not as investable in the current right. setup of the world, but it's, you know, hey, um, what about food waste? about a third of all the food in the world is wasted if it's beef yeah. especially that has a big methane footprint attached to it yeah. um, but also shifting our diets that you know in rich countries anyway um, beef is a bit you know maybe over consumed compared to our dietary um, recommendations in other countries it's still part of key um, food security necessity and nutrition but you know maybe you know where do you see those I mean, we talk about those a lot but i find it hard sometimes to see the investable opportunities like in food waste and uh, kind of mixing up our diets in ways that might be healthier. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first of all, the stat is that we we grow and then waste about 40% of the, of mm -hmm. the food that's available to us. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a different way of plugging leaks, right? There's a lot yeah. more we can do here to be mm -hmm. efficient at the, the literal transference of calories from, uh, you know, from grown food to animals to what we consume. Um, you know, ultimately, we do have to be consuming less beef, less red meat. We, we spend an inordinate amount of resources and time growing cows around the world. Um, of course, you know, that's not possible as a, you know, a, a categorical move across all cultures, across all places. But where yeah. folks can, it's not that hard to eat less red meat. It's healthier for you anyway. Um, and it allows us to send a signal over time to the market that there's less demand here and that we should think about maybe land use and growing food 
for humans um, in a way that's more sustainable as opposed to growing food for animals in a way that's harming us all. So, yeah. you know, so I think, um, you know, when we, when we talk about food waste, you know, we, we obviously are, are waste experts at, at full cycle. We, we work a lot in that space. I think two key things um, came up for us. One is, well, you've got to be able to separate the waste and make sure you have uh, capacity to move the waste that can be turned into something else um, through the systems that will do that. So we have a, a brilliant company called Vercel that does very highly efficient waste separation. It's not mm -hmm. sexy, but it's in, it's important and it's uh, and it's effective. Mm -hmm. Then we have a company that transforms waste uh, into chemicals and materials of value called Sonova, right? So folks are asking, thinking about, well, what do what what can investors do here? Um, you know, those are two kinds of two companies that of which there are many kinds um, that are in waste transformation. You know, that's one easy way to think about how we start to invest capital to scale these companies and their infrastructure. Um, you know, I think uh, by virtue of the ways our capital is sometimes invested for us, so retirement accounts and pensions, so I'm talking more broadly than the universe of folks who are professional investors, um, you know, thinking about kind of what are the options for you as as you know pensioners as folks who are who have capital invested for them you know this is a great time to think about the signals you send to those managers you know when you join a new company and they say how would you like us to invest your yeah. your yeah. pension right yeah. um you know there are now options for sustainable portfolios where folks will minimize the amount of capital going towards um, the kinds of companies that aren't managing their waste well and so everyone can play a role here you don't have to manage millions of dollars um, this really is about kind of the the consumer and the everyday person playing a role. Um, and then I think the dietary choices we make matter the most. So in order, um, it is, you know, who we vote for, a disproportionately small number of people have a large impact on, on yep. the decisions we make around climate. It is our everyday diets. That's a demand signal to, to the industry of what to grow and what maybe we have less demand for. Um, and then, of course, it's minding our wallets and minding our money because money is the resource that scales either the wrong technologies and companies or the right ones, depending on where we, where we put that capital. Yeah. So vote, eat, bank. OK, folks, yeah. we got our instructions. <laughs> Let's do those three things better. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I love that. I'm going to transition, though, to the COP process, maybe as a last question before we go to open up for a broader Q&A over to Todd and Elizabeth. Um, but, but closing out the methane thing, too, I, I'm sure there'll be some comments and questions, too. Um, uh, you know, reducing the you know, food waste and uh, shifting diets can be done and should be done in combination with kind of regenerative ag practices that seek to offset methane emissions by rebuilding soil carbon stocks. But these are actually friends. Sometimes they see these each other's adversaries somehow. They're not. Um, if we eat less meat and we waste less meat and we grow what we still eat better, um, it made everybody's job easier because it's just less work to figure it all out. It's kind of let's triangulate this together and find a way to make um, our ag agriculture systems more sustainable. But sometimes it seems like these camps are a little bit at odds with each other. They're not, mm. in my opinion. Um, and draw down pencils and stuff. So this is the only way where the math adds up is if we tackle it from a couple of different directions at once. And I really like that approach that you're taking, but also from the waste side. Uh, completing that cycle and saying, you know, in nature, there is no waste and everything's powered by renewable energy. So uh, maybe we should learn how to do that better too. Right. But, um, well, let's shift to the last kind of question I had for you today is, um, you've been really involved in these uh, so-called COP um, for, for the rest of the folks here. It means conference of parties. It's where the world kind of gets together. It's diplomats and big change makers uh, to think about climate agreements and the international policy process and how that's going. Uh, we're now heading up to COP28. Um, we have 28 of these things now. And um, you've been at many of them. Um, and they recently did something called a stock take, which is just like, let's take a step back and take stock, literally, of how are we doing as a planet? And it's a mixed picture. But as you go into COP28, um, focusing on methane and looking for opportunities, what do you see as an interesting play here? What, what's COP28 going to be known for maybe besides the controversies of being in <laughs> UAE, uh, yeah. but what about, what are some things you're hopeful about for COP28 that might be an interesting pivot point? Yeah, well, let me let me start by saying, you know, the, uh, the intersection of policy decision-making, of capital and of innovation 
um, is really rich and, un and underexplored for how we can have a coordinated response that really makes sense and that actually is achievable. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, we're, we're assembling uh, in about eight weeks time in Dubai for COP28. That's 28 bites at the apple as it were. Right. And now each each cop has gotten bigger and more uh, successively more important um, and urgent. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of the role that that I, uh, that I hope I've played over the last couple of years is introducing the best possible ways the private sector can play its corresponding role to the public sector commitments that get made at COP. That's really important. Um, you know, we can't make policy in a vacuum if the commercial markets won't also be party to what we have to do to either deploy resources or transform operations in order to be responsive to, say, a call to reduce methane by 30 percent, for example, yeah. which came out of COP26. Right. And so the COP is important, um, you know, but it is, uh, you know, we're, we're doing a stock take, as you said, and it is a stock take of where we got on the Paris Agreement. Um, you know, our grade is going to be poor. We should be prepared for that. The question mm -hmm. now is, what are we going to do about that? What are the decisions that we're going to make? How are we going to operate differently so that our next stock take demonstrates the accumulated results of actions that are meaningful and actually get done? I think it's impossible to, uh, to take material action on climate and not have a conversation about methane. Um, but to do so, it is going to require the largest firms producing energy and natural gas, the largest firms in agriculture, mm -hmm. the largest entities producing biogenic waste to be party to those conversations and to for all of us to have a, a solutions mindset, right? So sometimes in the private sector, we think of things differently than perhaps the public sector might think of those things. And so it is the hybrid vigor of our ideas in a setting like COP that is actually what makes it so powerful that we all of us, 70, 80,000 people will show up to Dubai to have these really intensive conversations and to make some key decisions um, around the actions that we can take over the next year. But everyone's got to play a role and be party to those conversations. And so that means that folks like me show up and say, okay, well, I don't know everything and I'm definitely not a policymaker, but I know how to move capital I know the science and I know enough about the solution set to galvanize others to also, also take action in that context. That's really important work. I'm, I'm so grateful to do it um, and to play this kind of role where we at least can share our thinking and help folks make better policy and make better decisions. And hopefully all of us come to both agreements that are, uh, that are meaningful and achievable, right? We should be talking about how far we got uh, from COP28 to COP29, because we sat around a table, got really serious about what's achievable, and actually took those actions in a time frame that mattered uh, for us to yield the results that we all care about. So, um, you know, mm -hmm. some folks are get down on the UN and on on the COP process. I think it's critically important for how we align our actions, um, and I'm really grateful that the private sector is paying attention. I will say um, just quickly on on Friday. Uh, the last day of, of climate week, you know, we put 80 uh, of the biggest corporates, innovators and investors in the room to talk about methane. You know, I will, I will say personally, this is kind of just me, um, <laughs> you know, thinking through, I was heartened to see everyone in the room, you, you put something out there to say, hey, let's, let's do an intensive, let's do a half day on methane and you think, oh God, I'm like, I'm a nerd and no one's going to show up. And actually people <laughs> showed up. <laughs> other nerds. <laughs> yeah, yeah, other nerds. But, but people showed up really curious, really ready to make uh, action happen. Um, yeah. And that tells me that in the context of a much bigger gathering like COP, we will have thousands of people focused on this issue. Um, we, we should all of us be able to figure, figure out the, the levers of action and then take those actions over the next couple of years to make a material impact on, on climate, to make a material impact on methane reduction. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, I mean, there are reasons that some, myself included, sometimes are a little skeptical of like, you know, international diplomacy through COPs solving all the problems all by themselves. But I love your approach saying, hey, no, that's one hand on the lever. Let's bring our other hands to the capital markets, the scientific community, the NGO community. We all pull together on multiple levers 
uh, maybe we got a chance at this. There's more than one lever. There's more than one sets of hands. Um, we can't abdicate responsibility just to a UN diplomatic corps and our elected officials, but they have to be there. Um, right. But we need to be there too, and you know, sure. move everything we can um, and try to find those leverage points, like methane, like emergency brakes, and move forward. Um, but in the interest of keeping a, a more conversation too, I was going to bring Todd, I guess, back on the screen, and he's going to help um, coordinate our Q and A here. I'm sure I see a lot of questions coming in, so uh, Todd, cool. why don't you take it away? And yeah, we have a super engaged audience in the background, everybody. We've got um, <laughs> about five pages worth of questions. So hopefully oh my we're going to stay around for the next five hours. No, just kidding. Uh, we'll get through a few of them here. So uh, Stefan and John, maybe quick answers to some of these questions that uh, sure. I'm going to send your way. Uh, the first one, Jerome is out, out of the gate asking a terrific question. Uh, Jerome is wondering why the billionaires are not buying into Project Drawdown's $2 trillion plan to address climate change as quickly as we need to. So any thoughts on why we're not seeing more aggressive action from individuals who really have the means to move the needle? So let me say a couple of things. Um, I mean, the first is uh, that rests on, you know, that rests on an assumption that, you know, folks who have billions of dollars aren't doing anything. That's not true. I mean, there are some real uh, profiles in leadership amongst uh, folks who have those kinds of resources. Um, you know, think about folks like Michael Bloomberg, who's leading the charge in so many ways. Um, you know, there's so many others that are putting, you know, their money, as it were, where their mouth is. Um, but the point, I think, that uh, the question is asking is, is, is really saying there could be a lot more action taken by a very small subset of folks. And I think the thing to know is that um, when you have those kinds of resources, your footprint is invariably much, much larger than the average person's. Um, even if you're not flying on private jets and taking your yacht to places, you know, you have uh, many, many multiples time, uh, times the, the footprint that, that most other folks do. Um, look, I think ultimately, you know, there's a, a principle actually at the core of a lot of UN work that is, that is uh, central to a lot of the work that we do. Um, it's called shared but differentiated responsibility. And that is to say everyone plays a role, but not everyone plays the same role. And so for folks who have means, and you don't have to be a billionaire, but for folks who have means, you know, the decisions that you make in your consumption, in your waste generation, in your energy consumption, in your capital allocation, and um, in the decisions uh, that you make in the voting booth, and the policies that you advocate for, a disproportionate number of billionaires have a disproportionately large microphone uh, into the market. These decisions matter for a subset of folks who have just a bigger footprint uh, in, in these realms. And, and I think uh, the question is a good one because everyone should be playing their role. And if you have those kinds of resources, it's time to pony up and think about investing in a way that is 100% climate aligned, 100% informed by the science and the data. And I can't think of a better resource than Drawdown to help guide those decision-making. We had a number of questions coming on the back end, back end specifically about full cycle. So I'll pull out one of these questions for you, Stefan. Um, so someone here is wondering, can you help me understand what impact investing or climate investing means to you, Stefan, and your firm? Is the ultimate goal of a company still to maximize the profit for shareholders? Or are you shareholders, or are you as shareholders considering a redefinition of what a company's key purpose is? For example, incorporating the impacts on employees, community, ecosystems at the risk of risk of compromising your bottom line. So how do you respond to that type of question? So there's an old myth that I think is, it's, this is a great opportunity to dispel. And it's that to invest for impact, to invest for climate impact, you somehow have to concede returns. Um, we've disproven that, right? Time and time again, not just from our business model, but so many other funds out there that are generating really compelling, inspiring financial returns that are outperforming the market and are delivering not just climate impact, but all the E, all the S, all the G. Right. And so, you know, it, we should take this moment to say that is a fallacy that no longer stands true in today's market. There are so many opportunities yep. to invest for impact and financial return. Um, what I think is really key to that question is, are we having uh, our eyes firmly on the intended consequences and perhaps unintended, unintended consequences of building new infrastructure, for example? So I'll give you a, a good point, a data point. Uh, in the United States, 
73% of our oil and gas and chemicals infrastructure exists in communities of color and low-income communities. So that's not an accident. That is by design relative to political power. Does it mean that when we build the low carbon equivalent, when we build low carbon energy infrastructure, when we think about circularity and recycling, we have to site that infrastructure in the same place? Of course not, right? We can redraw a map that is more efficient at delivering that value and doesn't harm people along the way. Um, this is work. It takes thinking, it takes intentionality, but it's not impossible. It is very much doable. And, you know, I think for us, part of our theory of change is we can design and build a world that works better for more people, that is more sustainable and more equitable. Um, these things are achievable. We've proven them at small scale. Now it's time to prove them at large scale all around the world. And all of that is totally achievable. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful that we can demonstrate that to the market so the market can move in the, in the right way of deploying those resources for impact across the board. Uh, seconding to that, maybe just briefly, it's like, that's such an important point. I hope everybody really, really internalized what Stefan just said so beautifully. Um, that old myth that, you know, the way to do business is to destroy the planet and hurt people. And that's the way to ensure long-term value. Bullshit. That's just wrong. You know, uh, this isn't about compromising returns or good business. It's about doing things better. Climate solutions aren't just solutions to the atmosphere. They should be done to make the world better, more equitable, more prosperous in the long run, and of course, more sustainable. We know how to do this. Um, you know, that old adage, you know, the, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. It's because we learned how to do things better. And if we haven't learned how to do things better since the 19th century and burning coal, to heat our homes and power industries, God help us. We do have better, we have lots and lots of better and full cycle and stuff on another. So I think are seeing the opportunity to invest capital and to you know realize value there. And, and you know, let's just spell that old myth that it's you know business or the environment. Oh come, come on, that's that's 1980s thinking. We we can we've that's just right. proven that for years. Now let's move beyond that. We have a few questions come in today related to the federal government's recent announcements about big investments in carbon capture and storage. So mm. throwing this out to both of you to, to think about, um, does the science warrant those investments is kind of a key theme that was coming up in the questions that we saw. Okay, um, this is a big, this is a question that comes up a lot. John, John and I have this conversation a lot too. Yeah. Um, let me, let me start from the macro and then, and then drill down. So the macro is on the long arc, thinking about the world's not just today, but all the way through 2100, um, stopping over at 2050 to see how we're doing. We are going to need uh, negative emissions technologies. That's the broad umbrella for the things we define as carbon capture. We're going to need this technology. Um, unfortunately, the role that carbon capture, mechanical, technological carbon capture can play at full tilt, meaning we build all of the installations, all of the things everywhere in the world is like very, very small, right? We're talking about one or two or 3% of the overall uh, emissions reduction pie, as it were. Mm -hmm. So um, it's going to need to exist, but it's like we're rolling down the highway and the entire dashboard is lit up with warning signs of everything going wrong and we are screaming and deploying the kind of capital that's being deployed into carbon capture about the windshield washer fluid, right? Meanwhile, a wheel is spinning backwards, our <laughs> alternator just fell off, uh, and the oil light you know, is flashing that there's no oil in the engine. It, it's an analogy that I hope is at least apropos to help us understand that we have to focus our attention on the most impactful and effective solutions first, and then work our way towards the technologies that will get us there. Um, if I were, if I had a magic wand, I'd wave it and put most kinds of mechanical technological carbon capture back to the lab so that we're not talking about kilotons of CO2 that get sequestered, not megatons of CO2, but gigatons of CO2. We are, we are in a race to move billions of tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere into the ground. And you know the best thing that can do that right now are healthy, natural ecosystems Nature has been doing this for millennia. Um, it is the technology that originally moves carbon in the way that the earth has intended. Um, it's where we should be focusing our time and attention if we're thinking about negative emissions. 
I think technological carbon capture is important, but it's important on a very long arc and in re relationship to other technologies just doesn't have the capacity to sequester what we think it, what, what folks hope it can. Um, it's a great idea. I think you, you stick a vacuum cleaner hose in the air and suck up some CO2 and drop it in the ground. It's simple, it's elegant. We want it to be the thing in our mind's eye that it can be, but the reality is it's just not ready for prime time. And in the meantime, the opportunity cost is not building out the low tech, low cost, highly effective infrastructure that can do that job a lot better. Well, and adding to that too, I couldn't agree more. Um, it is, you know, infinitesimally small, only absorbing seconds of our annual emissions at best. It's absurdly expensive. It's being subsidized by tax dollars, even though most of it's being operated by oil and gas companies, the most profitable uh, companies in human history. Why do we have to pay for it then? Um, but also it's worse than useless because it's creating a PR stunt for oil and gas companies. The CEO of Occidental Petroleum has said out loud in public multiple times that they love this technology because it'll help them continue to operate drilling for oil and gas for 60, 70 years into the future. That's a direct quote. So, you know, it's not just a useless technology that we're spending billions on for things that usually don't end up working anyway. It's actually a fig leaf to the oil industry and delaying the real action, which is to cut emissions first. Yeah, we'll need long-term carbon capture, but I bet on trees, which can do it far better. We, learned, we have to learn how to manage those trees in the future and steward them so they don't burn up and disappear. That's a problem. But this mechanical carbon capture, we should put a little money in the lab to bet on a long-term gain <clears throat> in a gigaton scale, meantime, preserve forests and cut fossil fuels. Stop giving them a fig leaf, especially on our tax dollars. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Two more quick questions before we wrap up here, because I want to get to one really important point that kind of came up in the in the Q&A on the back end too. And I think um, you mentioned before that investing in climate solutions can and does make money. So kind of setting that to the side for just one second here. Alma has a really great question about um, if one of the key priorities of investing is to make money off our investments, what about those critical climate solutions that aren't likely to make money or as much money for investors? How do we make sure those gaps get filled? Yeah, S such an important question. I'm glad someone's asked it. Um, some of the folks here, I hope everyone here at this point um, would have heard, for example, last year in the United States, we passed landmark climate legislation in the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, it's about $380 billion pointed at climate. Um, what I think is important in the nuance there is that it's not just money, it is incentives and subsidies for the kinds of things that maybe aren't yet ready for commercial deployment or aren't yet ready for commercial investment, um, but could use that little bit of government help to scale up to the point where funds like ours can make those investments. So um, the first part of the answer is government plays a role its differentiated role is to help fund and de-risk the kinds of technologies that need that little bit of lift to get to, you know, get to a point where the economics work. Um, this is also a key role of philanthropy, you know, to de-risk and create capacity for those technologies and those uh, strategies and practices to get into communities, get into the hands of operators. Um, so ultimately, you know, this is kind of the point we were making earlier. Not all capital is the same. And so the role that a lot of different kinds of capital can play um, is specifically to augment and support the ability for things to exist that don't yet have economics that work. Um, let me stop over and say, you know, we, we solved a particular problem faced by infrastructure by helping companies get from a small pilot demonstration of their technology to full commercialization. That's part of the role that we play in the market. What I would stop over and say is on the earlier side of the equation, when technologies are early or even yet before they have, uh, before you have kind of uh, many kinds of companies in a space, before you have management teams doing this work, growing that early part of the ecosystem, uh, informing it by what we know needs to exist much farther down the line is really important. So I'm heartened to see, for example, really innovative venture studio ideas come to the fore to say, well, what's the picks and shovels approach here? What ideas need to exist that don't yet have funding teams or operations that we can build to support this movement of capital towards climate solutions? Um, that's really exciting to see. 
And ultimately, you know, all capital points to that climate is important, but not all capital is the same. And so how we get companies and technologies and assets to a point where trillions of dollars can flow is by supporting them to a point where growth can happen uh, in the market as opposed to growth happening um, in a lab or in a vacuum. And so I think that's a, it's an important question. And I hope it gives folks an idea. You know, if you're not an investor, everyone can be a philanthropist. Everyone can give to organizations like Drawdown and others. And that's a really meaningful way to put capital to work and allow us to direct it to where it's most needed. Final question for you both here, and maybe just 30 seconds or less since we're at time now. And I'll put this over to Stefan first. Um, what's the one thing you want people to take away from today's discussion? Um, that everyone plays a role. Right. Um, gone are the days of quiet hand wringing, not knowing what to do. Uh, we know what to do. And the resources available to every person who has a cell phone, the Internet, a bank account, a diet um, are available to you. Uh, there are experts that are accessible, like John and others who are here, not just evangelizing around climate, but really uh, putting ourselves front and center to support the efforts of people to come into this space. Don't be shy, figure out what role you can play. Your lived and professional experience matters for this fight. You have a role to play in this climate fight of ours. And um, and there are those of us here who are welcoming you to play your role and, and to join arms in something that's really important for humanity. Yeah, it's, well, it's hard to actually follow. Thanks, Jeff, <laughs> but that was great. Uh, maybe just adding to this, um, you know, I, I like to say we're, we always live in a race between something in the world getting worse and something in the world getting better. But something is truly different about this time in history. For the first time in history, we can imagine a world where, you know, everyone can live a better life, where we truly achieve sustainability and equity and eradicate disease. We can have widespread education and really a world we can be proud of. Thousands of generations worked and died before us to build the world we inherited and I think we have an obligation to try at least to build a better world that stuff undescribed where we all step up, see what's possible and dream and stretch a little to go build an amazing world we can be proud of. Not one where we just stop climate change, the bad thing from happening, but also build a better world than we've ever imagined we've ever seen before. That's in our hands and it's only gonna happen if we all use our hands together to make that a real world possibility and an opportunity. And I think we can do that. And with all the people I'm seeing step up today and people like Stefan, uh, I think we will. I wanna say thank you to you both. This was a tremendous discussion today. Once again, we'll have a video recording of this out in about a week from now. Um, I should put in a plug as a nonprofit focused on climate solutions. We rely on support from individuals. And so if you'd like to support Project Drawdown, encourage you to visit, visit drawdown.org to do that today. Uh, finally, I want to thank all of you for attending for the fabulous questions. Sorry we, we couldn't get to all of your questions today. And then a really quick plug for next month. Next month's webinar is going to discuss how humanity, how humanity can solve climate change, alleviate poverty, and save biodiversity at the same time. So a little small problem we're going to tackle at next month's webinar. So join in then, and thank you once again for everyone for attending today. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.